We are back, and we are joined now by David Griscom of Left Reckoning, of Jacobin, of TMBS as well. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming on and breaking down the news of the week with us. Yeah, very happy to be doing it. Anything you want to plug really quickly besides, you know, Left Reckoning, of course? No, I mean, uh, you know, check out Left Reckoning if you're not already listening. We've got some good stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks, taking a deep dive into the drug war with Ben Fong on uh, the Tuesday show. So keep yeah, your eye out yeah. for that. Oh, that'll be great. Check out Dave and I on Left Reckoning where you can learn this sort of thing. <laughs> That's what it means to be a mighty man of valor. <laughs> exactly. We, we, we teach people to be mighty men of valor, whether you're male, female, whatever. Can you tell me what the context of that one is? This one? Yeah. That's what it means to be a mighty man. Of Josh Holly. We, we do not see the Josh Holly clip. That's Josh Holly. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, at, he, the, at, at the men's conference. He's just pastor. the blandest dude of all time. He really just does not stick in my mind. You know, I like couldn't pick him out of a lineup, honestly. Him I and tried. Tom Cotton, I, I mentally <laughs> mix them up all the oh, time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. It's very easy to do. They really are like fascist uh, extras in some sort of historical. Well, they're drama. Ivy Leaguers in, you know, the. Uh, Missouri uh, River Valley. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Him, Cotton, him, Cotton, and J.D. Vance make up the new uh, Senate Dead-Eyed Freak Caucus. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, River yeah. Mississippi River. Oh, oh, okay, yes, Not yes, Missouri. yes. Um, good you did that. Um, so, David, what's your reaction immediately to what we're seeing this morning from the Supreme Court? I mean, obviously just... Well, we started off the week okay, right, with the independent mm -hmm. state legislature theory being struck down. So pretty good news. Uh, the worst elements of, like, anti-democracy on the right were at least stymied for the moment. And then it just kept, kept getting worse. <laughs> Affirmative action in colleges struck down yesterday. Then this morning, two disastrous decisions, one in LGBTQ discrimination, uh, and then obviously the student debt cancellation being struck down. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, we can maybe talk more about like those individual cases and like what they mean. But I mean, I agree with what you all were saying before. I mean, I, I think that truly like the left in this country needs to get a little bit more bold about talking about this anti-democratic institution and like rejecting this idea too that like this is something new right um that this thread is is new like certainly there's a mm -hmm. particular ideological makeup of the court but this threat is always sitting on top of democracy these kind of arguments um you know about oh you have to look out for the court because the court could turn this way or that way has always been a way to try to you know push people, uh, force people to fall into line when it comes to, you know, presidential elections. And look, it's just as, as Matt was saying, too, it's like what drives me nuts about this conversation is people start to become very American centric, right? By saying like, well, if we don't have a Supreme Court, right, if we don't empower the Supreme Court to sort of overrule <laughs> democracy, overrule um, the overrule Congress, then the entire country will go into to chaos. And when you look at like the American system compared to other you know systems that you would typically compare American democracy to, they don't have this kind of bizarre unelected council of uh, you know priests um, overruling democracy. And like there's a very clear American history of progressives and socialists and radicals challenging the system. Um, you know, I, I think one th example that's really important to make is like. What kind of makeup, ideological makeup of the court do you think there was um, when Lincoln was the president? <laughs> do you think these were very nice liberals? No, these were very nasty racist. And thank the Lord um, that the radical Republicans at that time said, hey, we're not going to play this game uh, with the courts. The country is moving in this direction and we're not going to wait for the elite consensus of people from the top law schools in the nation to basically fall into line. I mean, and, and Lincoln, one of our great presidents, FDR, another one of mm -hmm. our great presidents who was incredibly adversarial with the court. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, I remember still uh, reading him in history books about his threats to pack the court, too, right, at that time. And mm -hmm. and um, I don't think they're as viable now. Right. But, but at the same time, it was more representative of him being adversarial with them. And history has has vindicated that kind of aggression because it was just even lbj like that the whole period mm -hmm. i think we have like a maybe a like the robert carroll master of the senate which is a great book um, but it leads to sort of like oh he was just able to like sort of technocratically figure out how to glad hand well enough but like there was an entire rhetoric of on the civil rights um movement that the senate is this institution that we know it is which is an anti-democratic check yes. on the people and mm -hmm. um, and and people that think like oh no let's just do the half measure where we 
grant that, oh, we do need to check on the people, but let's just reform it so it's not checky too much. Yeah. Is, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. Mm-hmm. And, and like also, I think, too, recognizing, um, you know, that the, the court understands itself as a political institution, right? Um, right. It, it understands that like it, it it has a worry, for example, about public outcry. Right. It's willing to do a lot of these things that we're seeing this week that are wildly unpopular. Um, but, you know, when you look at successful movements like with LBJ or FDR or Lincoln uh, with it is because those politicians recognized that this court is very worried about seeing that power be stripped from them yes. um, by a political challenge. So, yeah, I think it's 100 percent valid uh, to talk about these things. And it's very frustrating to see. I mean, there is this kind of bizarre cult around the courts, particularly with liberals. My one hope out of all this kind of bad news is maybe these things will start to sort of break down that mythology about this, you know, being an apolitical institution. It was a very clearly political one. That's why we talk about it so much. Yeah. And and I just want we had someone just uh, write in and say, uh, uh, Frida T. Law, without judicial review, these anti-trans laws that have been struck down and these extreme anti-choice laws would not be struck down. The problem isn't Marbury versus Madison. It's Fed sock and a an rigged illegitimate court. Expanding the court is the only reasonable and pragmatic solution. Frida T. Law, thoughtful comment. I appreciate you writing in. But there's an alternative there. If we didn't have those judicial review systems, you could have a strong executive in power that would say, screw you, you are in violation mm -hmm. of anti-discrimination laws on the Equal Protection Clause, for example, and this is the federal government overriding that. Um, and like, then that could play out as well. But I, I do not believe in... And I'm not even saying necessarily that judicial review would have to go away tomorrow, but from it would have it has to be severely limited. There is no other option. Packing the court just allows for more seats, and there are plenty of guys on the bench that are all funded by the Fed sock people that you discuss that could fill those seats in the end. I mean, it, it really is not to. Uh, continue with the seat metaphor but shuffling deck chairs and, and, on the Titanic. And I'm sorry we're not going to get anywhere near expanding the court a single person unless there's an actual threat of this like the, mm -hmm. you, the, like this is uh, again like it will require like a major like uh, uh, mem action by Congress probably right like yeah and, and that's going to take a movement of people but like we're not going to start the movement saying actually the goal of the movement is to add another, um, you know, Harvard liberal onto the court is, again, a waste of time. Yeah. And and on these like major issues like, you know, human rights for trans people, human rights for like queer people, affirmative action, etc. Like, you know, these court decisions don't settle them. In fact, they suspend them. Right. Like, you know, I mean, look what what happened. Like people had sort of, you know, assumed that, you know, abortion rights were enshrined. Um, in the U.S. system, and we're seeing, you know, in my home state and all states across that country, that's going, that's gone, right, for people. Yeah. Um, you know, and why did the Supreme Court make that ruling in, in the first place? You know, people sometimes, I think, have a misremembering of even, like, these kind of decisions that, you know, people uphold as more progressive or, or whatnot. Um, as like, oh, well, the court got together and they just sort of saw the wisdom of the arguments from the other side. It's like, no, there were massive social movements that were winning across the country. Um, and, you know, the court made a decision that was like in line with these social movements. Like the idea that the court just is delivering these under people that they're not responses to like the actual political conditions in the country is just wrong. And then um, the danger there is that it puts these things under threat where then later the makeup of the court changes, you know, decades yeah. later, it can go away like that. Totally. And I, I mean, it, it is also a um, important to remember that when they are more activists, they honestly trend to be reactionary. Plessy v. Mm. Ferguson is a great example of that. We're like, this is going too far and we are going to um, beat back racial progress in this country actively. So that is that is a part of the history of the Supreme Court that does not fit into like the American mythology and, you know, someone who loves Hamilton, the musical, may not find it to be palatable. But that's the reality of American uh, judicial uh, judicial oversight in this country. Yeah. And, you know, I, I see people who like, say, well, don't just pack it with one person, pack it with dozens. It's like, if you can pack it with dozens, why are we still keeping this institution around at all to say, actually, the EPA doesn't have that right to do yeah. that? Like, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 and, and, and we saw this play out with Roe, right? It did not protect... It, it, it put in stasis 
the political argument that we should have been having about Roe, which is women should be empowered over their health care by mm-hmm. the government with single payer. I mean, basically, like these are the things we have. You should be empowered to go get that, whether it's trans affirming care or whether it's um, abortions, you should be empowered to get that. And this whole like privacy thing, it just put that on ice until it was able to be rolled back by the right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let, let's play this really quickly, David. I want to see what your response is to this. Kamala Harris uh, yesterday at the Global Black Economic Forum in Louisiana. Um, she's asked here about the Supreme Court ruling overturning um, affirmative action in colleges and universities, essentially. I, I don't even know what to say about this response. Talk about your joy and leave us with some hope and some optimism because we are still here and we still have good trouble ahead of us. Well, (laughs) give me a minute. (laughs) Give her a minute. Joy. Joy. That in spite of the fact that a six to three court just undid affirmative action, that there is probably one of the most brilliant dissents that any justice of the United States Mm. Supreme Court has ever written, and her name is Justice (laughs) Ketanji Brown Jackson. Joy. Joy. Joy joy in losing. Yes. That's beautiful. And just to say that the woman woman that was interviewing her there was... um, the CEO of TIAA, the bank. So I, I imagine she's getting into. I imagine she's getting. Into, I imagine she's getting into a lot of uh, good trouble. Uh, Fasunda Brown Duckett. Yeah, she's she's just finding her joy with a like a eight figure uh, bonus or something like that. We're still here <laughs> at the economic forum. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to be there. <laughs> I mean, I, I that's that's beautiful, honestly. But like, look, I mean, she's a bad politician, Kamala Harris, and and in my opinion. Look, maybe I, I, Ketan- Ketanji Brown Jackson is impressive to me, and I think mm-hmm. her opinions have been. Yeah, I'll appreciate a good dissent as opposed to not. Yes. But it's a dissent. But and the elusive. problem is that she's only one person, yeah. and like I don't want to have her be a mascot. I want her to be effective, and and so that's not. Yeah, the way this was supposed to go is that um, in, in my like um, sort of like Obama era belief in the Supreme Court, it was like the Alitos. Those are supposed to be the mascots d- just lashing out in their little descents with their little rhetorical flourishes. But no, they own this crap now. And it's this it's the same sort of bullshit, but yes. they actually win. <laughs> And it's like this, I'm sorry, it's just like this bizarre fantasy that a lot of liberals have about the court that like, you know, this is where like ideas go to spar, right? The most brilliant minds in like Mm -hmm. the American society are going to go. And, you know, you see this a lot where people complain like, oh, Clarence Thomas doesn't ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, when, when they're hearing a case, it's like, because he already knows what he's going to do. Right. Because he understands that this is like a political institution and he's going to rule politically. It's almost refreshing. That, it's like, all right, well, we, you're you know, at least it, just being honest about your process, dude. And I'm sorry. It's just like, this is like, you know, I, you know, I think like Harris is like, I think a very bad, like politician to the masses, but she's very good at speaking to like her class basis or like the kinds of people um, in, in the like leadership of the Democratic Party and sort of surrounding it. We're just like, yeah, you know, we lost, but man, I put the best footnote in that. Descent. Oh, we lost pretty. We lost pretty, right? Um, our form was impeccable. And even though we were trounced like 42 to 17, we, I mean, we stuck to our game plan. We really did. And it's just, and you, yeah. And, 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 and politically, I mean, like, this is one of these things that, um, you know, in, infuriates me about um, the, the way that the Democratic Party fights institutions like the Supreme Court or like the Republican Party in general. Um, because, you know, all this stuff does is it continues to demobilize people like, you know, thinking about student loan debt. Right. You know, a lot of people were very excited. I mean, you know, myself being one of them, I have, you know, significant amount of student debt, as do a lot of working people, a lot of working Texans. Um, you know, and remember what those calls were like when you, that decision, you know, when when they came out, I was like, oh, you know, you should have done more or whatever. But, yeah, this is going to be very helpful for people. A few months later, people aren't, you know, watching the process and seeing, you know, the incredible dissents on on these things. It's demobilizing. And like, you know, there was a really good investigation after the uh, most recent midterm elections in, in Texas done by Texas Tribune. I'm forgetting the author where they did something that people very rarely do, uh, which is talk to non-voters. 
mm. um, and ask them what they think, you know, and like, despite the kind of idea that like, oh, non voters are sort of ignorant or not following things. It's like, no, a lot of these people were people who maybe came out very hard for Obama in 2008, 2012. Um, and saw that, you know, their standard of life declined after being promised so much and feeling having this feeling that like, oh, maybe politics is not a way um, that I can improve my life or my community's life. Now, obviously, like I'm involved in politics. I want to change that mindset. Um, but look, what does this kind of thing do for turnout? What does this kind of thing do for people like even dropping Biden and like the leadership of the Democratic Party? What does this do to us? Right. Like if I want to go out and knock doors for a progressive candidate in Texas and I say things like, you know, we want a Green New Deal, we want a just transition, we want Medicare for all. Well, people will say that sounds nice, but I've been promised a lot of really nice things before. Right. And like these kind of things are really, really damaging, I think, to the the politics of, of the Democratic Party. They're certainly damaging to the country. Um, the one thing that they're really helpful for with them is um, fundraising getting more money um, and paying for more for, for more staffers and consultants um and also using it to sort of browbeat the left that you know the left is for you know the left is always to blame for right <laughs> for political failures of of the ruling party yeah i mean you talking about how disempowering it is is i think really key because um i that's the anti-democracy of the supreme court that is exactly mm -hmm. what it is it makes people feel even more disconnected from the direct democracy that should be a part of our society. I mean, the Senate does that with the filibuster. People have no idea. Why can't, like, we get gun, common sense gun control passed when it's like polls of over 90% with most people, or why can't we get, um, I don't know, just very simple uh, laws that are in, in people are in favor of basic gerrymander yeah ger like right that mm -hmm. kind of thing lincoln uh, and, and it's because of the institution of the senate but that's it, it we're talking about how anti-democratic the senate is that's a way lesser level than what we're even talking about with the court here oh so yeah I'm no I, 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 in my position we'd have a unicameral a legislature <laughs> and no supreme court i would love if the senate was like an a, a ornamental uh, ornamental body <laughs> exactly, yeah. dress them up like the uk does the lords but yeah exactly. here's, a, here's, a, here, here's a, a quote from a radical abraham lincoln uh, in his uh, inaugural address in 1860 um, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the supreme court the people will have ceased to be their own rulers having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal Good, thank you lincoln mm. for those sorts of eminent mm -hmm. tribunal you know, um, yeah, I mean, th this is about principle. And, you know, I, I sort of, I need to uh, correct myself a little bit. Ryan Cooper talks about judicial review, and it's a little bit overstating the case to say that it goes back to the founders even. It does not go back mm -hmm. that far. And uh, Cooper makes the case that actually the founders would be surprised at how far, uh, like, the Supreme Court has taken mm. it. And so it would either take, you know, action by Congress to say, like, hey, you can't overrule us on this, or uh, an executive to say, hey, uh, Oh, you and what army, which has been happened before for bad reasons, but um, yeah, like yeah. Phineas Erb writes in and is is kind of not happy with our commentary. She was asked to leave on a positive note. She was asked to leave us with optimism and joy. It's crazy to me that you guys are doing this right now. My opinion is that I'm fine with people is trying to imbue joy into the public, but I think it's completely, for the most part, something that actually makes people angry because they don't feel joy that it, their student yeah. debt cancellation is not going to happen. I don't want bedtime mm -hmm. stories from people who are supposed to be in charge of all this stuff. And I'll, I'll I know this was about the affirmative action case, but still, I mean, it's the general posture towards the court that is makes people feel like you're an out of touch elitist. It's bad politics. This thing where they're like, I at base level, yeah, like we hear you. The U.S. Department of Education um, two days ago posted a tweet saying, and look, this sensitive issue um, suicide talk about, so, you know, I, I want to be, but they said, get, call this number if you're committing suicide. What they could have done is post research saying, if you are indebted, you are 2.5 uh, times more likely to uh, commit suicide. That's where we're at right now. And so like this, like Ted Lasso stuff, like that I got mad about earlier, you have the levers of power. Yeah. Stop hearing us and act. Yeah. And on top of this, I mean, like, you know, for the group of people who are supposed to be like the Supreme Court understanders or like the politics understanders, right? They understand the threat of the right. They understand the threat of the Supreme Court, right? That's why... Um, they, they say to left settle down on these things, right? Well, where is this when it comes to like policy, like on the student left, uh, sorry, on the student loan question, right? 
this only becomes available um, to the Supreme Court because of the way that Biden tried to cancel student loan, a student loan debt. Right. There are many other options he could do. He could just cancel it all by means testing. It created this opportunity. Mm. We'll see what he does. I'm not very um, you know, confident that he's going to come up with the solution here. But like, you know, you get this or like other things like Obamacare, for example. Right. Of, when that goes to the states, the states are going to undermine it. Right. And there are certain states where Obamacare works better than others. Right. The states like mine, right, where, you know, you have the right and control, they undermine it. Yes, the right is doing that. But this is also what happens when you create policy that gives the right and the Supreme Court and all these other anti-democratic forces out there the opportunity to undermine these things and to make them unpopular because they become ineffective. Um, and, you know, this is the thing that is like it's always like, oh, it's a big surprise that the Republicans are going to undermine a you know, a political program put in place by a Democrat or, you know, the Supreme Court is going to rule against something um, that is, you know, universally helpful to a lot of working class, poor and people of color in, in the case of like the student loan um, uh, cancellation. Right. It's always like, oh, well, God, they're just so wicked and evil, aren't they? And like what we need to do is just sort of remind ourselves that we're the good people in the story and they're the bad people. No. Nah. Mm. It's at this point, it's like we need to win. It, it, like, it is just unacceptable at this point, unacceptable at this point um, to continually bang on about the Supreme Court, bang on about the danger of the Republican Party, and then to falter against them at every chance and opportunity, every conflict. Right. Back up your claims about how dangerous they are with action that is yeah. comm commensurate with their danger. Um, I mean, I think that kind of that, that's my tact. Um, but but you, you let, let's transition to uh, away from the Supreme Court before my head explodes. Um, <laughs> you, you wrote a piece uh, along with Alex Burnell in Jacobin about mm -hmm. this new uh, legislation called the Death Star Bill or HB 2127 in the Republican controlled state legislature in Texas and um, I had seen the part about how Greg Abbott basically overruled statutes in Austin and, and Dallas was the other mm -hmm. uh, uh, city that mandated water breaks, especially in the midst of this extreme heat that we're seeing um, in, in Texas. And we will continue to see due to climate change, mandating water breaks for construction workers who are predominantly uh, non-white migrants in some instances. I mean, that was like the top line element that was so egregious. He just essentially said, yeah, screw you and your democracy in these cities. I'm going to override this and make sure that the workers don't get water breaks and then banned the ability for similar legislation to be passed in other areas of the state. That was so egregious. But you write about how much more there was, if you don't mind, starting yeah. at the water break thing and then and then branching out about what's going no, on. No, no, totally. I mean, the, yeah. the, this. So this is called the Death Star Bill by the Texas AFL CIO because it is like one of the most damaging uh, pieces of legislation that we've seen um, in, in in Texas politics in a while. Um, I will just say, like, you know, for me, uh, you know, I always try to figure out how to cover these things, right, and how to write about these things. And like, you start with the water break stuff because it is so egregious, you know. Um, and the stuff like that is personal for me. You know, I used to work in concrete. Um, I used to, you know, in, in, in construction out in the hot summer sun, and I know what those conditions are like. And I also know how little many bosses care about the safety and the well-being of their workers. Um, you know, we've seen horrific examples. Um, a lineman, uh, lineman died uh, recently in, in East Texas. Um, I believe in Dallas, someone else died from a heat exposure. Um, in the Tesla Gigafactory, a worker died um, from heat exhaustion as well for building Elon Musk Gigafactory around here. So, yeah, it is something, um, you know, to be like very up in arms about because it's absurd. You know, and also like the water break provisions. I'm not trying to come at all the people who fought really hard to win them. You know, they're like 10 minute breaks every four hours. Right. Um, you know, like these are very, very marginal um, protections and people deserve even even more. I mean, that's the sort like, of thing any worker should be empowered to do just at any point they wanted to. Right, right. <laughs> You know, and, and and of course, you know, people get water breaks even without the these these things. But the thing is that these have to be mandated and pushed because there are plenty of institutions and bosses and companies out there that will try to force people to work in dangerous and unsafe conditions. Um, you know, one thing I think is really important too, just on the water break thing in general, is like we definitely need to have federal heat standards in this country. It's absurd at this point that we don't, mm. um, and it's life and death for for many people. 
But yeah, so this um, this this bill, so on September 1st, those local provisions in cities like Austin and Dallas will go away. Um, but it's so much broader than just the, the water break issue um, that, I, you know, I think it's really important breaking down what exactly this bill does, because the water break thing, you know, is taking the headlines because it's so egregious and so clearly cruel and anti-worker. But this is everything, frankly. Um, that, th that this bill um, covers. So this was put forward by uh, Dustin Burroughs in the House, um, Republican from Lubbock, um, and it's a, called a preemption bill. And uh, what that means is it basically preempts localities and local and city governments from being able to pass any kind of rule or legislation on um, things that state code covers. So we're talking about things like water breaks. We're also talking about things like fracking bans. Um, we're talking about environmental procedures. We're talking about ability to um, rule over healthcare, housing. Um, basically, it strips local government in the state of Texas from being able to govern. Um, and it's been presented as that. Um, uh, Dustin Burroughs was being interviewed by this right wing organization and he said, it's really a stay in your lane bill. And, you know, a lot of these local right. politicians will be happy um, because it means that the only thing that they're really going to have to be worried about doing is filling potholes and not having to answer big questions um, about governance. And um, we'll have to see how this plays out in the courts. I'm not very confident, um, you know, but I don't want to preempt that and say that maybe, you know, things won't be rolled back. But what this really is about is it's about denying people in Texas the right to participate in politics. Um, and it goes along with a lot of other attacks on local democracy in the state. Um, I've written for Jacobin about how Greg Abbott, for example, has used the COVID-19 disaster declaration um, to overrule um, local and, and and city ordinances on things like COVID-19, how he's used COVID-19 um, to redirect funding and funding Operation Lone Star. I think we talked about this the last time I was on here. Um, and, uh, you know, doing things like being able to recall uh, district attorneys who are elected, um, you know, by the people in, in their district to sort of reflect the values and ideas that those people have about how they want the state uh, to prosecute um, in in their in their region, um, and yeah, you know there there's also you know move to basically be able to strip and pull those people, um, uh, you know those elected officials um, from their position if they sort of break um, with you know state government. Particularly, what that means is if they do things that Greg Abbott and the Republican controlled ledge don't like. Um, and, you know, we could talk maybe a little bit about some ways to push back against it. But a couple of things I think are really important is like, one, this isn't just water breaks. I mean, this is pretty much every kind of labor protection that we have. This is yes. pretty much every kind of healthcare protection that we have, every kind of environmental protection that we have that is put under threat by this if it contradicts with state code. Um, the way that the Republicans and a lot of people have covered it is using their framing, right? Should we have less regulation? Um, or more local control, right? And I think that's a really dangerous and false framing because you're accepting the way that they want to put it forward, right? Because what this really is, is about denying the majority of Texans the ability to be able to influence their local politics. Remember, like, you know, like, look, I probably participate in this a little bit too, right? The kind of mythology of Texas as this kind of rural state. It's not anymore. 90% 90 90 of Texans live in urban environments at this point. Um, so what this is, is taking away power from the majority of people in the state to empower the minority. And that minority is frankly the Republican party, um, which not only on things like this, but on all sorts of issues like um, uh, abortion to gay rights, it's really out of step um, with public opinion polling on all of these kind of issues like you know texas yes is like a republican controlled state in a lot of ways the political map leans republican but if you look at like the actual opinion on a lot of these hot button issues of texans the way that the republican party is governing is not in line with these things at all so the only opportunity that texans have to maybe push for a more a politics that's more reflective of their values and ideas has been on the local level and that's why the republican party they, they've been spooked by the potential of good examples, right? If yeah. working in Austin is better than working in a county outside of the city, oh, that might be harmful for Republicans politically down the line. So this is an attempt not only to deny democracy, but also a response to a threat that they've been feeling that if you know you can have more progressive politicians and policies in, in the major cities in the state, um, you know that might be threatening to their political power and legitimacy.
I mean, and I feel like they might have lifted this a little bit from what is happening in Mississippi. I don't know if you followed that, but where um, the state legislature essentially di- has disempowered Jackson from mm-hmm. doing a lot of things on a like local city level and is overriding the ability of state of cities and parts of their state that are more diverse, more non-white people, maybe more mm-hmm. of like organizing action happening in those areas and attempting to cut their legs off from under them it is the definition of big government that they're supposedly in uh hateful towards but it's um i mean i it, and it also to, to return to your point about disempowerment how in disempowering is this where you feel like you can't get involved on a local level in your city and try to advocate mm-hmm. for positions that are going to help you and that you're electing politicians that are supposedly representing you, but they don't have the ability to do so because of what Abbott and the Republicans on the state level are trying to do. So, and, you know, and also like this is part of a larger trend. Um, you know, there's a lot of bills that have been sort of put forward to sort of limit uh, local power and to sort of cement the power of the central government here, the state government. Yeah. Um, you know, you have this uh, this move to build a business court um, so that rich folks and businesses in the state of Texas aren't heard in the rest of the course that we're in, but they can actually have a special district where their cases can be heard. Um, there was another bill that was put forward to turn Austin into like a district of Austin, like a kind of, you know, thing like DC where people are disempowered. Um, and the, the city government here is basically run by the state. Um, that didn't succeed, but like, this is like the, the attempt from the right. And what you were just talking about, about this being disempowering um, for both like local political movements and for local politicians, there's something that's really important too to remember that I think has also been un- un- uncovered because this is just such a broad bill that it, you know, it can be sometimes hard to you know, talk about it um, just because it touches so many things. One thing that's really dangerous in this bill um, is it, it gets rid of immunity for elected officials. Um, so what that means is mm. that like if, if there is a, a you know, local legislation that is passed in the city of Austin, um, typically that would be in, in, if you were to sue the city, you would sue the city um, over it. This would actually allow you to sue individual politicians, um, which, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, just already being disempowered also like puts people in danger of themselves, their livelihoods and their lives being put under threat. Um, it also includes a change in venue. Um, a provision, which would mean that like a, a county, for example, that touches uh, Austin, it, the the lawsuit could be um, could originate from a neighboring county and also be heard in that county. Um, you know, and remember, you know, Texas, you know, everyone knows the cliche, right? It's just like very progressive blue cities and then sea of red around them it means that, you know, you could um, have somebody who has personal li- a politician has personal liability right. for, for representing like their this. constituents. That's insanity. It's it, it is truly, um, you know, you know, it's empowering to, you know, it's empowering to business interests outside of, of the cities. And like, um, you know, it's it's extremely, extremely dangerous. You know, we already have an uphill fight sometimes with working with some politicians. Right. As I said, like there have been like a lot of progressive um, victories. Um, you know, there's a lot of great progressives in San Antonio. Um, you know, Greg Kassar was uh, who's now a congressman, um, you know, came came up around here. Houston um, has, has been having a lot of success. Outside. Anyways, we could go through all the cities. There's a lot of great work being done on, on the ground. Um, but, you know, this is a real direct threat. So like for those people who are more marginal, that you have to do a little bit of wooing, a lot of you know push to get them to support common sense, progressive pro worker policies. I mean, this gives them a, a big excuse. Um, to, you know, to not pursue those those kind of policies. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why they call it the Death Star Bill, because it, it really is something um, that is going to undermine decades of, of victories in the state of Texas. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I mean, I could talk a little bit about some of the ways that Alex and I were, were trying to cook up for people to figure out how to fight back against this. But I think one thing that's really important is just to continue with the, the framing of this, that this is not less regulation versus local control. This is about minorities trying to govern over majorities in the state. Well, um, everyone should check out that Jacobin piece. We're going to put a link to it in uh, the description below uh, so people can check it out and also your work over at Left Reckoning, of course, and whenever you're writing there. I just wanted to read this IM. Um, I'm very active on the IMs in the first hour today, <laughs> but 
had to read this to you before we say goodbye. Um, Dylan from Australia. I, I have so m what, what? That's a Patreon. Oh, right no. oh, really? Well, no, it's actually, it, yeah. it's very nice. I have so much respect for David Griscom's ability to talk passionately and eloquently on a broad range of issues without losing uh, his laser focus on how the left wins. He's the best part of left reckoning. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all, uh, definitely worth supporting their Patreon. Little... Little, uh, sure, thanks, Dylan. Appreciate jab it. We'll for <laughs> Matt. <laughs> can, can I just say one quick thing, Emma, if you don't sure. mind? Sure. Yeah, um, go for la it. Last thing on this, I think it's just like, um, you know, one, uh, Matt is a very important contributor to Left Records. So <laughs> we if don't accept the, yeah. that. Um, except, yeah, the heart and soul, really, in a lot of ways. Um, but the last thing I, I just want to say really fast is like, okay, if the politics is blocked um, right now, it means that the fight has to go in, into labor. And you know, just because these things are blocked on the state level doesn't mean uh, on the political level doesn't mean you can't win these things in contracts. So for Texans listening to this, this means it is critical that you support the the or the institutions like the Teamsters who are fighting for things like air conditioning and better protections for themselves. Support the nurses who are on strike here at Ascension um, and recognize that, like, even though the Republicans might be able to control the legislature and the state government, the vast wealth that is created in the state is created by the work of millions of Texans and recognizing that you have a lot more leverage than you are told. Um, and if, utilizing that to fight for yourself and your neighbors and your coworkers is the only way we're going to be able to get out of this, this kind of crisis. So no time for despair. It's time to get to work. Absolutely. David Griscom, thanks so much uh, for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Enjoy it. Thank you.